Hi, this is Jay Schaefer with Skylapser.com. Today I want to talk about RAW versus JPEG a workflow on shooting time lapses. A lot of people out there will tell you that you should never ever shoot JPEG and you should always shoot RAW whenever you're shooting time lapses. And I agree with this for the most part, and for the most part this is true. But today I want to talk about a couple instances where you might want to go ahead and shoot JPEG and where JPEG actually fits in the time lapse workflow. Let's go to screencast and I'll kind of demonstrate. I'm opening Adobe Bridge CC and I'm in a folder here that I've already prepared and we've got a couple images in here and uh, we have an image which is a raw file from a nighttime time lapse that I took and then we also have a JPEG which is essentially the uh, same file as I would shot this time lapse in the raw plus JPEG mode in my camera and what happens is the camera essentially uh, shoots a raw image and then saves uh, and compresses and saves alongside of it a JPEG image uh, of the, of the uh, raw file. And so let's take a quick look at, at a comparison between these two files and the first thing that we'll notice is if we come up here is they were shot, shot with the exact same settings F2.5 uh, 12 second exposure, auto white balance, and ISO 1600. Uh, and if we look at the resolution, it's is 4,976 by 2,800. And then on the JPEG, the file size is 7.14 megs. And you, you'll see that it's in the sRGB color space. And if I switch to the raw file, and we look at that again we've got the same settings f25 uh 12 seconds auto white balance iso 1600 and again the same resolution uh 4976 by 2800 but you'll notice that the file size is twice as big at 16.34 megabytes over the jpeg and you'll notice that it's untagged and the the Real big difference between a, a RAW file and a JPEG file is, of course, that a JPEG file is uh, compressed and therefore has a bunch of settings that are baked into that file, whereas a RAW file uh, keeps a lot of the RAW data from the sensor and allows you to adjust that later. And so, for the most part, it's a question of quality versus quantity, is that uh, it, you know, the traditional thinking was that raw files took up too much space on your hard drive and uh, uh, on your camera card and that JPEGs were much more compact and allowed you to do uh, longer time lapses and also saved you hard drive space on your computer. And nowadays that's uh, not as true as it used to be because uh, hard drives are, are cheap and, uh, and also camera cards are, are cheap. And so I, I think that, you know, that, that part of the argument is, is probably not the best part of the argument. Um, however, if you do shoot raw and you don't have the proper software uh, to, to uh, process that raw image, then you might be stuck and not be able to actually create a time lapse. So if you uh, don't have the, the proper software, is that maybe the JPEG workflow is better for you. Uh, I just want to talk really brief, briefly about kind of the difference between uh, the quality in a JPEG and a RAW file. And if we look up here into our metadata here, you'll see that the bit depth for our RAW file is 16 uh, bits. And if I go back over to the JPEG, you'll notice that that's 8 bits. And what that translates to is the amount of color information that, are, that is in the image. And uh, to, you know, just go quickly over it, uh, uh, JPEG with 8 bits is 256 levels per color channel, which is called a 24-bit or uh, true color image, and that ha can describe 16 million colors. Whereas in uh, the case of this actual camera, while it says 16 bits up here, the actual camera is only capturing about 12 bits, and so that would be 4,096 
uh, levels per color channel or 32-bit color and that file can describe 68 billion colors and so anybody can tell you that in math that 68 billion is more than 16 million and so there's a lot more color information that you can use in processing a raw file and also uh, a JPEG file is compressed uh, uses spatial compression and so we can actually look at, I want to compare two files here, is that we have this file that was taken with the Panasonic GH2, and it's 4,976 by 2,800, and it's 7.14 megabytes. And I'm going to compare that with an image taken with a GoPro camera, and you'll see that it's actually smaller in resolution than the uh, Panasonic JPEG uh, at 3840 by 2,800. Uh, but it is larger at, at, at 8.11 megs. So it's, it's amount, the amount of compression affects the file size in a JPEG. All right, let's talk about workflow. So I've got a, a kind of a diagram here, and uh, this is for using a piece of software that I, I like to use to, to process my, J, uh, my uh, time lapses called Panel Lapse. And so if you photograph your image as JPEGs, and you may be stuck doing that if you're using uh, an, I, uh, an iPhone or a, uh, a smartphone of any sort, or for so let's take the example of a GoPro, which only shoots in JPEG. And so the, the kind of the workflow is kind of the quick and dirt, what I call the quick and dirty flow, workflow. All you do is take that series of JPEG images, and then they're an image sequence, and you put that into the software for processing, whether it be QuickTime or uh, Panel Apps or uh, whatever uh, application you're using to turn those, uh, that JPEG se sequence into a video file. And it processes that and that turns it into a video file. Quick, easy, and uh, you know, it done is beautiful. However, kind of the more common workflow is to take, uh, if you photograph in RAW or if you throw, uh, um, photograph in JPEGs is pre-process those images to get the optimum exposure and to, to make up for any kind of uh, odd exposure things that ha tend to happen in time, time lapses and you can color correct and stuff like that. And then once you process those images, then you output them as a JPEG sequence, bring that into your software to turn that into a video or turn that into a uh, uh, processed JPEG sequence for like, for example, using dflickr. And then you can either uh, have that final video file straight out of there, or you can do some additional post-processing in, in that workflow. So the, the bottom line is uh, that if you are shooting in uh, RAW, that's probably the best way for quality and you have to pre-process and, and it takes a little bit longer, but you'll probably end up with a better uh, looking time lapse. You can go with the straightforward JPEG uh, straight out of the camera, make yourself a time lapse workflow. And oftentimes, if you're just posting something to the internet, that's a great way to work. Uh, I want to go really briefly into image processing. And so if I go here, I can, uh, if I double click on this raw file that will bring that up in adobe camera raw which is a great application for processing um, your images and so i can go in here and i can hit the auto button here which will optimize my exposure and then I can do some adjustments here. So, so if it's, for example, I can see my blacks are clipping here and I'll bring those out so they're not clipping anymore. And I can do a little bit of a, a vibrance to bring out the stars and a little bit of saturation to bring out the sky. I can also adjust something like color temperature to make the image a little bit bluer which is I found is more pleasant and then a really cool thing that I can do is I can bring I can actually do some noise reduction here because uh, this image was uh, shot as underexposed and so therefore it has a, quite a bit of noise in it and so I can uh, add uh, some noise reduction there 
And then once I've done with that image and done uh, the processing I want to do, is I can click Done. And if we come down into back into um, Adobe Bridge, you can see that we have a little settings icon here that lets us know that we've done some processing to that. And what that's done is generated a XMP sidecar file with all of our settings and adjustments. However, it has not affected the original image. Uh, those original pixels and all that original data is there and then that those settings are just kind of applied over the top of that as a sidecar XMP file. So if you're using a JPEG workflow and you do have the uh, Adobe Suite, or either Lightroom or if you have Adobe Camera Raw and Photoshop, is that you can open your uh, JPEG images in uh, Adobe Camera Raw. And so that's the preferred workflow for uh, doing those adjustments. So I'll go ahead and right click on uh, this, this JPEG image and you'll see that I have the option to open in Camera Raw. And I can do a lot of the same processing that I, I did in the uh, JPEG, uh, in the raw image, although you can see right off that this is uh, far noisier and has less color information and that the uh, histogram is quite a bit different. So I'll go ahead and fix the black clipping here and uh, I can uh, take the temperature, turn it a little bit bluer and uh, I'm gonna bring the exposure down slightly and you can see this is quite noisy and if I add some vibrance here then I can go back here to my noise reduction and try to reduce that noise a little bit and then if I click done here is then it does the, the, uh, the adjustments to that file and you can see that if I switch back and forth that uh, that uh, I, I kind of think that the uh, uh, raw file has a, a lot, uh, it looks a lot better. And so uh, that gives you higher quality. So bottom line is uh, don't be afraid to, to shoot a time lapse if you only have JPEG as an option. So for example, if you want to shoot with a GoPro or if you do have a camera that can shoot camera raw and you have software to process with it, that is the way that you should go. You should always shoot raw if you have a camera that is capable of that and you have the software to process it. And so uh, that's uh, the basic difference between a raw and JPEG in shooting time lapses. This is Jay Schaefer for Skylapser.com. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit us on the website skylapser.com.